Good evening, everybody. My name is Marty Otanez. I am the project organizer for a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and funding. And I want to welcome you and all the audience members here, and those of you online watching. Um, this is an incredible event. We're at Green Labs. Um, here in Colorado and we have uh, an event between now and uh, 10 p.m. with a series of panels, one on production, one on consumption, and one on um, funding. And the purpose of this event is to raise awareness and get uh, individuals, academic people, get individuals who are community members to discuss the um, events or, or opportunities available to do cannabis research and education. So after uh, panel number one, we have a uh, dance group uh, it's a Aztec dance group. It's We See Le Poshli from Denver, and they're going to um, come after panel number one and bless the space. But what I'd like to do to get started is um, I want to introduce on my left uh, two individuals who are going to be on panel one. So you're looking at panel one. Uh, next to me is Jolene with uh, the OSHA Connection, and then Frank Conrad with Colorado Green Lab. So we're going to have a little back and forth, and I'm going to turn it to Jolene to introduce herself and give us a little background about her work in the cannabis sector. Thank you, Marty, for organizing this and bringing us here today. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, my name is Jolene Donahue. I'm the owner of the OSHA Connection, LLC, and we help employees avoid unnecessary fines through OSHA compliance and employee safety programs. We've been working with the cannabis industry for several years now, and it's been a, an interesting um, niche to get into, to say the least. Uh, I'll have a couple of pictures to, t to show you in just a little while, um, and we can talk about some of the challenges that come up when we're looking at employee safety in relation to cannabis. Excellent, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Hi Marty, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Frank Conrad. I'm the laboratory director of Colorado Green Lab, which is a analytical testing facility for cannabis in Denver. We uh, actually test quite a lot of things, including um, fungicide resistance in like powdery mildew, um, resolve like problems with like analytical testing, validate processes for extracting edibles. We've actually done a lot of like problem solving in the cannabis industry. Um, particularly focused on like pesticide resistance lately because it's become a growing issue in cannabis cultivation after the last two years have expanded it enough to become a problem. So, anyway, thanks Marty. Uh, what now? <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, so what we'll do is uh, I want to keep this real simple and I want to keep it informative. So the first thing I want to ask both of you and as you can see, the, the running theme is production issues. So uh, Frank mentioned a bit about pesticides. I know Jolene does work um, looking at worker protections and occupational health and safety issues. So can you go a little bit deeper into some of the top issues right now that you're working on uh, in order to make the workplace a little safer for workers as well as employers uh, to be uh, you know, good employers? Absolutely. There are two main areas that cause us the greatest amount of concern. One of those has to do with electrical safety, simply because there's so many lights, there's so many different operations that are needed in a high humidity or a wet environment. And so what we're finding is that workers are exposed to electrical concerns where they're not really aware of what those hazards are. And um, what we find is that there's just a lack of education about electrical safety in general. There's been um, situations we were called on, um, OSHA came in to respond to a situation where there were electrical files, fires as an extension cord went through water, um, and there were some fires and sparks going outside of that. So rather than um, address the water with the electrical, they just called OSHA in. And so there's, there's other ways of helping employers respond to those kind of situations. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Frank, you want to expand on uh, what one issue you feel, at least in the area of pesticides, is um, uh, something you want to share a little more information about? There are a lot. <laughs> Give me a moment. Um, because it was something we were working on this week, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, the cannabis industry does not have, um, for example, like a regional pesticide management committee in the same way that other agricultural industries would. So... Uh, what we found interesting is about the development of fungicide resistance is that were this to happen in another industry like soy, corn, um, there would be a network of people to be like, all right, stop using this particular chemical because it's both not working and you're making the thing stronger. Uh, so one of the clients we had, uh, I think it was about a month ago, their particular type of mildew that was infecting their building, they asked me how they could kill it and they meant chemicals and I said, burn the building down. Because <laughs> so you may only be able to kill this with fire. And he's like, are you kidding? And I was like, well, yeah, that's not a good solution. Let's, um, 
what we ended up doing was actually heating up all of his rooms to about 100 Fahrenheit so that all remaining spores would be unviable, cleaning out room after room and then moving the plants in so that we slowly eradicated it from the whole facility. Because chemicals are becoming not, um, they're becoming less and less useful in cannabis cultivation because of the development of resistance, particularly of fungus, to, uh, to these commonly used chemicals. Excellent. No, really, and there's so many different issues to talk about. Uh, maybe back to Jolene. Uh, think about uh, in terms of education. What do you believe right now in the cannabis sector with your expertise would be one area that is uh, deals with education that needs a little more development or needs broader dissemination? Absolutely. I think one of the key areas that's that's looked at is respiratory protection and we're dealing with chemicals and products that people aren't familiar with. It's a newer environment. Um, there are products that have been there in the past, but with the changes, there definitely is a lack of education in the respiratory protection area. Uh, we have been called in on, on many situations where we have employees that are wearing respirators that haven't been trained to do so, that haven't had a medical evaluation, and it really is putting them in a hazardous situation, and they don't even realize that there's danger there. Um, they see a dust mask, they see um, an N95, which is actually a respirator, and they don't realize that there's a hazard with putting that on. They think they're protecting themselves from, from something. Um, so there's an education piece about what they're actually protecting themselves from, as well as what they need to protect themselves with the respirator themselves. Excellent. Um, uh, Frank, you want to also go and uh, share with us an issue that um, deals with education, like increasing knowledge among consumers, but also among um, the general public and, of course, decision makers. Well, related to consumers, we have, uh, we have product testing for every other industry. And I think the consumers are so used to seeing, you should not use this product because of this danger, this danger, that they are, they feel safe. And that it's assumed generally that um, cannabis is getting the same level of testing and has the same level of regulation as other more mature industries, and it, it doesn't. It's not really its fault. I mean, it's been only around for around two years recreationally, and that's when it really boomed. But that cum consumers, that lack of knowledge there may need them to making choices that they assume may not be dangerous, but they actually might be more harmful than typical products. Uh, the federal government regulates a lot of industries and tests for contaminants. I made the interesting example on social media the other day that a couple years ago there was a contaminated dog food and cat food coming from China, and that this was a large, this was a big deal, and that there was testing for it at the FDA level, and that it seems a little strange that the federal government would all right, this is a priority, and despite the number of consumers um, potentially using cannabis products that have pesticides in them, they have not intervened. Mm. It's, it's, it's an awkward situation. The federal government, it's still illegal. It's legal at the state level. They're kind of like, all right, let's wait to legalize it, so everyone's slowly moving toward that. But in the meantime, consumers are getting exposed to chemicals that they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. Wow. No, thanks again, Frank. And um, Jolene, it's so great to hear both of you. I think what I want to now um, is switch gears a bit, maybe take, a, uh, take us back a bit and tell us a bit more like when you first got started, what was that, uh, the line that you crossed at one point when you realized, my God, now I'm into cannabis. Like, was there one moment you remember? Can you kind of share that with us? Um, I, I don't know that I had one particular moment, but it was a very specific decision to make. I had several phone calls where there were complaints being filed unjustly against employers, disgruntled employees that were no longer working there, and employers that were just being blindsided by unnecessary fines. And so um, just the entrepreneur in me wants to help. And so with that, I decided to take the leap and work with the cannabis industry because yeah. they need help. Yeah. And they sh no employer, no business owner, period, should be blindsided by something that they don't know exists. And so giving them the tools to really take back ownership of that is something that I take a lot of pride in. Mm. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Well, I was working as an analytical chemist in the petroleum industry, and um, there's so many questions in cannabis because it's been illegal for so long that haven't been answered that most of the experiments we do in our lab every day are, no one has looked at them before. And it's, uh, I mean, at least with modern, uh, modern tools. So when I decided to switch from that industry to this one, part of it was because it's, it's really fun to get to do science experiments every day and learn something new and then put up on a blog. And it's completely new to everyone. So that was about, um, it's probably about three years ago now. And we moved into working in cannabis, um, we started our lab about two years ago and moved into our current space one year ago. So three years ago in October. 
<laughs> All right. So both of you, yeah, interesting history. So what I'm going to do is just take a second, and I want to um, tell people we're live on uh, Channel 56 uh, through the help of Denver Open Media, and we're here at Green Labs in Colorado, um, actually Denver specifically, and I want to thank Green Labs. I also want to thank Denver Open Media, WMMJ TV, also Goodfellas Bail Bonds is one of the gold sponsors for the event, and Cloverleaf University is also a gold, le a gold sponsor. Uh, Story Center, based out of Oakland, has been a supporter of this. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. And we do have a pizza truck out in the back here at Green Labs uh, for those that are interested in pizza and Coke. So what I want to do now with those two speakers, Jolene and um, Frank, could you um, tell me with, or share with the audience um, here, what one thing do you think would be great to have more research on? Like in OSHA Connection or in Colorado Green Lab, what one thing do you think it would be great to have a little more research and then explain your answer? Absolutely, that's that's a great question and one that I'm I'm really happy to answer to uh, to bring up today. Um, more testing on what's actually in the air, and and I will explain that because it's kind of broad. Um, we have I work on a regulatory committee with the state of Colorado, and there is a whole team of industrial hygienists that have come into laboratories, that come into grows and dispensaries, and tested surfaces, tested the air, tested the environment to see if there was THC in the air. Um, to see how much people were being intoxicated by the chemical, and um, it was very negligible. However, there have been times where there's baking or in the process of making edibles where we've heard stories about people being greatly intoxicated and or the employers are using employees that have a higher tolerance at peak times. So that means that there must be more in the air than we're actually realizing. And so I'd really like to see some additional testing as you're going through those areas on how much is actually being ingested while those processes are taking place. Good. Excellent. Thank you, Jolene. We do a lot of like scientific research on like pesticide resistance, but I'm going to move away from that. Um, one of the things anthropologically that would be interesting sociologically is that consumers in Colorado and even the United States are very cognizant of pesticides used on fruits and vegetables and organic produce. And that Colorado, um, that consumer perspective of cannabis is that often that it's organically grown, but it's actually not in many cases. So some manufacturers and growers are moving toward that standard, but that consumer perspective, it would be interesting to find out what their knowledge is of what pesticides and at what level they're used on cannabis cultivation. Excellent. So maybe another kind of question for both of you is why is it important for a consumer of cannabis to be knowledgeable about the potential for contaminants in the product? So do you, are you suggesting, Frank and Jolene, that there are issues at the workplace level that are harmful for workers when it comes to pesticides or when it comes to using the product? Um, why is it valuable for that knowledge of the consumer? Like, are there public health issues that, are, are you're, that you're concerned with? Do you mind if I... No, go ahead. Uh, one of them is that cannabis is one of the only two commodities that, well, there are other ones that are illegal that people smoke, I guess, but, okay. So tobacco is an agricultural commodity, people smoke it, so is cannabis. Um, most other types of pesticides that are used on cannabis versus like grapes, you don't smoke mother, most other types of produce. Burning chemicals and inhaling them is generally not as healthy as eating them. You don't want to do either, but one is worse. So that's one of the things that at least in terms of consumer protection is it's not an obvious leap because the only other commodity is tobacco and people do not associate tobacco and cannabis, but in the way that they're ingested, at least flour, it's, uh, it's similar. How about a, a different perspective from you, Julian, with your expertise in the workplace and potential hazards or risk of hazards uh, that you find? Um, generally, you find a lack of education across the board. Employees aren't aware of what they're working with. And so sometimes they are using too much protective equipment, which is okay. But a lot of times what we're finding is that they're not using enough. And so just an education on what products they're actually dealing with, whether it's the pesticides or chemicals, cleaning environments, um, the product themselves they aren't always aware of. Excellent, thank you. So now what I'd like to do is ask if there's anyone in the audience that has any question that deals with production that you'd like to ask uh, Frank or Jolene. This is related to pesticides. Is there much cannabis that is, that is raised aquaponically as opposed to hydroponically? The reason I ask that is that aquaponic technology tends to avoid pesticides because any pesticides that's applied to the, the plants um, is actually harmful or even, even lethal to the fish. So it tends to be kind of an organic technology in general. Uh, do you want to um, pass the floor? Do you want to restate the question so people can hear it? Uh, sorry, what was your name? 
Go. Remember th my name? Oh, I don't have to ask. Uh, <laughs> question was, is, have we seen a lot of aquaponic uh, culture conditions versus like hydroponic? Is that accurate? I've never seen that. <laughs> I'd be interested to see that happen. A student of mine mm -hmm. had converted a medical marijuana facility in Boulder mm -hmm. from hydroponics to aquaponics, and which, you know, basically the fish are providing nutrients instead of food. No, makes sense. And uh, he said that the productivity of the plants increased about 50%. So it, it, it's a technology that avoids pesticides that is worth looking into. Okay. So, so thanks, Greg. Um, I, what, what comes to my mind when I heard that question, from a research perspective, we don't have a lot of knowledge of these experts who um, smoke marijuana and know like the intricacies of it. So a potential research project is you get a number of people who smoke marijuana produced in soil, a number of people that smoke marijuana produced in hydroponics, and a number of people that smoke weed produced in aquaponics, and you assess, can and these experts, I'm no expert, I couldn't tell the difference, but I bet there may be a person in the audience that might have the ability to tell the difference between those differently grown um, uh, uh, weeds. So that, thanks for the question, Greg. Uh, any other questions or observations about production issues for Frank or Jolene? Do you know of any uh, particularly effective pesticides that are armory certified that are uh, good for growing that could replace a lot of uh, pesticides that uh, can you restate the question? It was... Um, certified organic uh, materials uh, review institute, I believe. Uh, so so like grass, uh, generally recognized as safe? It's probably equivalent. Put the mic by your... Oh, sorry. Generally recognized... The uh, question was, are there any OMRI certified pesticides that can replace the current synthetic pesticides that are being, um, basically being banned against cannabis cultivation? The general perception is that and this is not a statement of my opinion, this is, the general perception is that many organic pesticides, they don't have the same mechanism of action, and therefore they don't have the same efficacy as synthetic pesticides. That being said, with the rise of fungicide resistance, one of the points that's made about powdery mildew in other industries is the best way to not have it is to never get it. So having practices, for example, in like the hops industry in the Pacific Northwest, uh, one of the cultural practices they have is that at the start of a season where they would ordinarily get powdery mildew, they strip off the lower levels of leaves that would get infected, and it reduces the rate of infection by 60%, no pesticides, because they know that it will be a problem at a specific time during the year. So it doesn't quite answer your question, because the perception there, there's been no side-to-side -side testing with some of the organics compared to the synthetics. This would ordinarily be something that, say, a federal agency would do. There's been no real side-to-side -side testing or research published on that on cannabis. Great question, thank you. So maybe for Jolene, I understand that some workers and employers, they want to do the right thing, and so people are using protective equipment, whether it's a respirator or some other you know, gloves. So give us a little bit more depth on what's one concern you see in terms of workers' knowledge of these uh, ways to protect their health. So there's a, there's a great lack of knowledge, and I spoke about that briefly with respirators and the use of respirators. Um, they are a way of inhibiting your breath and things that are going into your breathing zone. So if there hasn't been a medical evaluation or if there's an underlying condition that we're not aware of, um, there could be great problems by putting a respirator of any type on. And there's just a lack of education about that because they're so common. We see a white dust mask at, at Home Depot and so we think that it's okay to put on where in a work environment, when you're wearing it for multiple hours, it can really cause a problem. And so just helping the, not only the employer, but the employee know what those risks are when they're taking those steps is very important. Could you tell folks, uh, let's say 12 months from now, what kinds of collaborations don't exist but you'd like to see exist and focusing on what topic? Everything. Um. <laughs> I mean, any, to anyone in the audience, like, what questions do you have about any of the things related to marijuana that you've questioned before? Uh, raise your hand if you've heard the, if it burns white ash versus dark ash, that it's contaminated or not. Who's heard that, that idea? Just a couple of you? Okay. So one of, my friend Damien, who might or might not be here tonight, there he is. One of the uh, points that he and a um, couple other cannabis smokers told me is that if your cannabis ash is dark, then it means you had chemicals or pesticide in it. And if it burns white, that it was clean. And I was like, 
I wonder if that's true. And I realize nobody had ever tested that, but that's kind of like common community knowledge. And as a scientist, once we get our mass spec up and running, that's a fun question to answer. <laughs> we can put it to rest. So in terms of like any other, anyone else in the cannabis industry, like we have a unique opportunity where something has been not studied or blatantly misstudied for 70 years. There are many, there are many types of cannabis papers that came from law enforcement that when we've tested them in my lab, I was like, oh, that's not even true. So we have an opportunity, everyone, if you have a scientific question you want answered, go ahead and ask a scientist who's in the industry. We'd love to test it, whatever it is. I think I'm still, still at a loss. I just have so many thoughts in my head. Um, as far as the OSHA regulations go, they've been in, in place for a number of years. Um, there is still a lot of unknown ground as to how it's going to be received. Because it's not yet federally sanctioned, the inspections done by OSHA are not routine, but it's on the horizon. And starting in 2016, OSHA is making some major changes. One of those is that the fines are increasing from a, a table of 7,000 to almost 13,000 um, for serious citations, which is, which is most of what they find. Outside of that, repeat or willful citations are going to go up to $120,000. And so we're seeing a lot of, of history being made there. Um, there's also a, uh, a lot of repeats within um, the employees that are being exposed. So if you have six employees with an exposure, OSHA is starting to do um, citations per employee and not just per instance. So you can do the math there if you have seven, seven employees citations, you know, it adds up pretty quickly. So just, I mean, just across the board, the regulations need to, to be looked at. Excellent. Thank you, Julian. So to remind you folks, we're live on Denver Open Media Channel 56. We're at, De uh, we're at Green Labs in Denver. And I want to open it up to the uh, live audience here. If you have any questions uh, for either Frank or Jolene, uh, then we would, uh, we would appreciate a, a quick question. Uh, I was just notified we have w less than a minute before we, knew we move to the next part. I have a quick question for Jolene. <laughs> is it uh, 7,000 cap and 100,000 just for the cannabis industry, or is it all industries in 2016? All industries. Okay. Excellent. So um, thank you, Frank and Jolene. Uh, what we're going to do now is take a little break. Uh, throughout the evening, we have some digital stories produced by students in a course at UC Denver called Cannabis Cultures. So we're going to run one of those videos, and then when we come back, we're going to have a live performance by Denver-based Aztec dance troupe, We See Lei Posh Lee. You know, we have to some extent addressed the fact that no one will go to jail in Colorado for cannabis-related crimes, or at least the vast majority of cannabis-related activity. Uh, however, there are many individuals in jails across the country that uh, are currently being, still being punished for things that society has agreed probably never should have been a crime in the first place. So many of the uh, legalization initiatives that have been drafted, and some of which we expect to move forward, uh, do include provisions, uh, generally they're considered called like resentencing provisions, where uh, people previously convicted uh, for behavior that would be a felony, uh, that would no longer be a felony under the current law, the way things have been changed in that initiative, uh, would be able to go to court and have their uh, uh, records sealed or uh, amended in some manner. So if you look at all of the individuals that are uh, incarcerated for cannabis-related crimes, many of them are minorities and people of color. Um, and what we've seen in, in certain circumstances is that uh, cannabis legalization has not really addressed the uh, harms that were created previously due to prohibition. You know, researchers could do simple things like, you know, interview uh, inmates currently that are serving terms or incarcerated for some reason related to cannabis, um, you know, and tell, you know, provide those stories to policymakers who you know, generally don't hear from folks like that and really understand it. And so it's a lot easier to assume that these are, are bad people deserving of punishment when in fact many of them are, are good upstanding citizens that were just simply uh, caught up in an anachronistic government policy. When you go into a recreational shop and you're meeting with the bud tender, ask them if they were one of the companies that had recently been cited for violating pesticide application use laws. 
um, to save time, you can also call ahead of time to see, and you can also check online. We have that information available on the consumer website. Okay. Um, so the second question that you should ask is, has this cannabis been well flushed and well cured? And what that means is that at the end of the growing process, you're supposed to flush your plants to uh, drain it of, of contaminants, pesticides, what have you, for at least two weeks. And then there's a minimum two week curing period. And how to tell if this cannabis has been flushed. Unfortunately, you have to take it home or wherever you can consume it safely and consume it there and watch how it burns. And the best way to tell if it's clean is that it will burn with a, a, a light gray ash that is easy to wipe off your hand. Um, and then if you're smoking it in a bowl, it'll be reduced to almost nothing. If, a, if the bud is contaminated, if you ash on your hand and you rub the ashes around, it'll just smear black all over. It just becomes very messy. Um, in your bowl, you just get a solid black coal. And at that point, I recommend calling the shop where you purchase your cannabis from and asking if you can exchange for another product.